Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Hodinky Radio. Today's guest is a true legend. The one and only Fred Savage is returning to Hodinky. He's an actor, producer, and director, best known for his role in The Wonder Years and The Princess Bride after getting his big break in a commercial for Pac-Man Children's Chewable Multivitamin at the ripe old age of six. He's also a watch collector who I've seen get excited about vintage galet, paddock, and everything in between. Of course, you might also recognize him from his 2018 Talking Watches episode. Since then, he's become a fixture in the vintage watch world, and I always look forward to crossing paths with him. Fred Savage, thanks for joining the show. It is a pleasure. It is a pleasure, gentlemen. Uh, as always, a tremendous fan of the uh, of the podcast, and um, obviously of, of Ben of yours and oh, Tony um, from back in the Rescapement days. I, I I knew you when I was a fan of your work. So this is a, this is a real pleasure and. Uh, an honor for me. So thank you for, for having me. But well, the feeling is mutual, Fred. You know that. The feeling is indeed mutual. We've come a long way, might I say, from you DMing me on your Instagram burner account to bringing you into the fold of the Hodinky Radio podcast. And I'm excited to have you here. Fred, I think I want to start with this. Uh, you know, you and I are, are in this WhatsApp group chat, a bit of a cult-like sort of thing. And you posted in there just the other day about a watch you had recently acquired, I believe, for your 20th wedding anniversary. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, that. First of all, congratulations on on 20 years of marriage, uh, something Ben and I, I'm sure, both aspire to. But I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and and the, the watch that was gifted to you. Um, yeah, of course. Of course. Uh, it, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah, 20 years, certainly a milestone. A um, lot of road, a lot of road. <laughs> <laughs> that's 20. Um, but, um, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I was telling my, my, my wife, we went to dinner with the kids, you know, and I feel like in those 20 years, pretty much every dream I had, uh, has come true, you know, for, for life, for family, uh, we have three amazing kids, this wonderful family, this wonderful home. And, um, it, it's a real, real milestone. And so, uh, but that's also like 20 years of getting each other gifts. It's a lot of Valentine's days and anniversaries and birthdays and Christmases and a lot of gifts. And so I didn't even know if we were going to really get each other anything. Um, and, uh, and so we were at dinner and, and my wife pulled out this box and I got her a gift, guys. By the way, guys, don't you know? I we didn't know. You know, it was a little like gift to the magi, but I ended up getting. I I had something for her, so don't don't worry. Um, but she 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 wrote this beautiful card and all about the date. She was very focused on the you know all these important dates over twenty years, you know, the kids' birthdays and our anniversary and our dating anniversary that we celebrate. And our, our these twenty years is full of these dates that have taken on this incredible meaning. Um. You know, high times and low times, but there are all these dates throughout throughout twenty years. And she writes these beautiful cards, and so I opened the I opened the box, and it was a old. I'd never seen this kind of Rolex box. You know, vintage seventies Rolex box, little angle on top, and there's an instruction booklet inside that even says you can use this for cigarettes afterwards. Um, and I'd never seen a box like this, so I still didn't know. Like maybe she got me like cool Rolex cufflinks, or you know. I, I just couldn't imagine my wife getting a watch for me just because we we haven't really talked about a watch. And so um, I opened the box and it's this just this killer 1970 Rolex Datejust. And um, she was talking about you know, how dates are so important. And she just loved that this uh, this early, you know, the, the Datejust was like the first complication that Rolex threw into their watches and how. You know, this was such an advancement in watchmaking, having like an automatic watch with a date that flips over at midnight. And, you know, that, that a date was such a significant thing for this watch. And this date's so significant for us as a couple. So she connected all this incredible meaning. And then it just really, for me, um, it just hits all these incredible notes uh, for where I'm at kind of in my watch collecting. And I feel like so many watch collectors, certainly I do, but a lot of friends that I talk to, a lot of people at our WhatsApp chat, uh, Tony, um, you can get this like seven year itch. And so you look at your watch box, you're like everything I have is just garbage. Like, I don't like any of this. Like I, I've gone down all these terrible roads and, and while I haven't gone that far, I'm looking at all my watches and I'm like, you know, I'm at a point in my life, I, I'm not going to be a diver or a, in the military or a pilot or a race car driver or, you know, all these use cases 
boxes for all these tool watches that I that I have. Like, you know, I'm not I, this is not all pass me by, but I could still be a gentleman. I still <laughs> have a chance to be a gentleman. And so I I was like, I need to get more watches. I don't how many sports watches can a can a guy have, you know? And so I'm like, I need to start developing this beyond, you know, I need I need gentlemen's watches. And so this watch, you know, it's on the, you know, the Jubilee bracelet, which I got a a GMT Destro last year. And all my watch friends were like, well, once you go Jubilee, you never go back. And boy, were they right, because uh, this Jubilee is gorgeous. And so uh, it has this great Jubilee bracelet that I love. It's got a silver dial. So, you know, all the all the you know, watches that I have are black dials, mostly some white dials. So I don't have anything like it. And it's a dress watch that goes like day, day to night really easily. And I, I, I'm, I'm with my family right now. We're in Idaho. I'm doing a little last family hurrah before school starts. And um, I, I, it's the only watch I've worn. I mean, you know, people talk a lot about like the one watch collection. You know, what, what could that be? And I don't think I had anything in my box that would that would do that. But this is just uh, I don't know. I just I just love it. And it, it's imbued with all this emotion, obviously, with our 20th. But boy, if, if there's a one watch, this is I wouldn't I would nominate this. This is just killer. Um, I uh, I absolutely love it. So I'm sorry. That, that was a long <laughs> That's answer. That's a great one. But like it, it hits it's, all it's these. It, it touches all these things. It's it, it's it's just a great watch. And I the other thing is so many things in my watches, the watches that I love the most, I think, you know, a lot of watch people talk about the, the hunt, you know what I mean? They find this watch and they covet it and they read up on it and look at all these perfect examples and maybe they finally get it. And, um, you know, if they're lucky and, uh, and then there's always a little bit of a letdown, like the hunt was the, the, the fun of it, you know? Yeah. And I feel like my favorite watches in my watch box, um, are ones that I had no intention of, of buying, you know, whether they're, you know, you know, the high end, you know, really, you know, the more expensive or valuable watches, you know, in my, in my watch box or, 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 or just low fun stuff. My favorite watches are the ones that I just like saw and like, wow, this is so cool and fell in love with it. And that love is still exists. And this is one of these, I was, we never talked about date just, I didn't know a lot about date just. So I was doing a lot of reading afterwards about the 1603 versus 1601. And I, you know, I just didn't know a lot about it. And, um, and, so this kind of takes its place in my collection as uh, a watch that I think I'll love forever, but had no intention of getting or wanting or wasn't on my radar at all. It's cool to see someone like you, Fred, get so excited about, might I say, a relatively simple Rolex Datejust. So a reminder that uh, the thrill is sort of <laughs> never gone, even for a guy like Fred Savage. Y you mentioned the talking watches there, and I want to talk about sort of how your taste or collecting has evolved a little bit. But before we get into that, even I'm wondering, since you and Ben are both here, if you guys, if there are any sort of just fun behind the scenes stories from, from filming that day back in 2018, it must've been that, that either didn't make the cut on to the final episode or just, just weren't ready for prime time yet that you sort of remember looking back on sort of fondly or, or funnily. I learned a really important lesson that has stayed with me ever since and has informed so many decisions I've made after that. And okay. that is, I was an avid reader of, of, of Houdinki, uh, I, I, you know, consumed all the talking watches, you know, watched them. This is, you know, many years ago. So there were not as many talking watches. I'd watch them over and over and over again. I feel like I knew them by heart. Um, I, I, you know, I didn't know Ben at that point. And so all these names were, or, you know, that I, you, you come to know as a reader of Houdinki were these kind of mythic names and, and part of this world that you kind of, you know, look at from afar. And I got a phone call from Cara Barrett, you know, the Cara Barrett. And she's like, hey, we'd love you to be on Talking Watches. And I said, no, no. <laughs> because I was like, I don't belong on Talking Watches. I've seen all the episodes. Like, I don't, that's not, I don't, I have too much respect for you and what you're doing. Thank you so much, but that's just not for not for me. And I got home, and my wife's you know I was talking to my wife, I'm like oh what's you know said I got a call from Hadinki about doing talking watches. She goes, are you going to do it? I said no, I don't, I don't, I don't belong. I have too much respect for them. She's like, so you're telling me you have too much respect for them because they're great at what they do, right? I'm like yes, they're the best. And so she's like, so why are you telling them like how to do their job? Like if you like them so much and they want you to do this thing, you know. 
say yes. Why are you being such a, a fool? And she was 100% right. Like any sort of imposter syndrome or, or, or whatever or, you, know, you feel like you have um, is not greater than my respect for, for, for Houdinki and for Carr and Dan and the whole team. And so I was like, oh, my God, you're right. So I called Carr back. I'm like, never mind. Never mind. Like, let's do it. And I'm so glad I did because I got to meet, you know, all these people that I, I, I'm still in touch with today, you know, whether, whether it's Ben or, or, or uh, Cole or, or, or um, you know, Steven or Cara. You know, there are all these people who have taken on these really important roles in my life. And I'm so glad I said yes. But like that voice in my head, like it, even as recently as uh, last year's Rolly Fest, I got a phone call from Jeff Hess. He's like, we're doing a panel, you know, at Rolly Fest. We'd like you to be on the panel. And my first reaction was, no, 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 no. You know, like I, I this, that's a room. I, I, I have no point, you know, sitting on a panel with, uh, you know, Bernard Boulong and, and, and Morgan King and uh, Greg Selch and uh, uh, Lee Stafar, like in front of like the room of the greatest collection of collectors and dealers and watch scholars. I don't belong on that stage. Uh, and while I, maybe I was right, but Again, my fear or, or imposter syndrome wasn't greater than my respect for Jeff. And so I was like, if Jeff wants you there, uh, I should say yes. And again, I did. So glad I did. But that was all a lesson I learned from, from, uh, from that invitation, that first phone call from, from Cara. Like, if you like someone or admire someone so much, you shouldn't tell them how to do their jobs. <laughs> like... It shouldn't you hear that, Tony? That, Stop so. telling me how to do my job. <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, honestly, Ben, no. Um, but, uh, or Clara knows, yeah, really. She knows. Uh, she definitely knows. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, that was honestly, like, I remember that so vividly from, from the talking watches. And literally, like, that conversation with my wife has stayed with me and informed good decisions, like, ever, ever since. So I, I have a few memories that, that aren't from that experience, but are other Fred Savage experiences. Do you remember oh, the time we went to Rayo's together? Oh, I mean, completely. That was a fun, that was an incredible dinner. Incredible that was a world-class dinner. dinner. And so we, we go to Rayo. Somehow I, I, we have a friend that, that has a table there. And Fred comes and Fred showed up in a coat and black tie. <laughs> and everyone else is like dressed like pretty casually. And, and I was like, Fred, like, are you coming from you know, like a funeral? Are you coming from an important business meeting? <laughs> oh, did I and lie? Did I lie and say yes? <laughs> no, no, no. You were like, no, this is like, this is like a big night out. I dressed up for dinner. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, you dress for Rayos, uh, very old school. Very you old school. Dress for Ben, and you know, when, <laughs> you know, when Ben says, "Oh, there's a few watch guys who are going to be coming," I don't know who's going to be there. And so, um, you know, I'm a big believer in always be a little overdressed and under. You could never be under underdressed is just bad. You little right. overdressed. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I also remember I was working, I was shooting something in New York, and like. You're on location and you're away from your family. Like you're so, it, it's so boring sometimes. Like work is great, but after work, it's so boring. So I was like, oh my God, like I brought this suit. I could bust it out. And um, yeah, I have no regrets. No regrets. I feel hey, like- well, you look great. You look you, great. You, you, you got, you guys, every one of that table deserved, deserved the, uh, the coat and tie. I regret nothing. You know, we talked about the talking watches there. That was six years ago now. What have you been up to in, in watches since then? How have your sort of, Tastes evolved. If I recall, I'll recap for the for the listeners while you sort of think about how to answer. Yeah, this. tell me what, what was what, what, what was on there. You had what some quirky gone? stuff. You had that. You remember that Helbros vintage alarm watch? You had a Galay chronograph. Yeah, yeah, those all still in there. The Bell and Ross that I believe your wife bought early on that eventually you you know was kind of the mock ten sixteen until you got a ten sixteen. Yeah, uh, yeah. The original Illinois watch that I think you got from Wanna Buy a Watch that kind of started it all. Any big ones I'm missing in there? Uh, no, no. I mean, um, it was, it was great. And that honestly, that was kind of what I loved about, uh, you know, just Ben and Houdinki and, and talking watches is that, you know, you know, I don't have, um, you know, these, these, these grail, these quote unquote grail watches, you know what I mean? I don't have a Daytona, you know, uh, I, I have nothing with pointed crown guards. Um, you know, uh, I, I have no, you know, 5700s. Um, you know, I, I, I leave that. So that's, that was why I was like, I don't know what we're going to be talking about, but we found all these kind of cool, uh, 
esoteric watches that Ben was really interested in and thought the audience might be also and that you remember, Tony? Like that's that's so that's so cool. Yeah, I mean, I you know to say you know I've kind of stayed in that in that in that pocket a little bit of of um you know I've gotten some really phenomenal watches that all that that have become that were again kind of grails for me, but became grails, you know. So. A 5402, you know, I, I've, so uh -huh. I've got like some, you know, some great, like great classics, you know, um, which I love wearing because it just kind of like, I look at that watch, um, you know, A series, Royal Oak. And uh, how, how uh, early are we talking on the, on the A series? Second, the second thousand, the second thousand. Right. So it's like it's like 1400 or something, you know? Okay. Um, and so, uh, but I love looking at that and thinking like, wow, this is like the one that like kind of launched a thousand ships, you know, like That's I, I love, watch. I love that history. Um, you know, for, like the big stuff, like, uh, I got a Rolex commando that I, again, didn't know anything about, but got, does it say commando on the dial or is it says a... commando on the dial? Yeah. Great. I think it's at six, four, two, nine. Um, like that. and uh, it says commando on the dial. Great. Like lollipop seconds, small 34, yeah. but where's yeah. great. Um, can you talk a little, and that's then, like, the one I was going to ask you about because the, the few times I've come across you in the past few years, you're often wearing that watch or get like chronograph, uh, Talk a little bit more about the Commando. Tell tell the people about that watch because not a lot of people know that story still. So the Commando, um, and and you guys kind of checked me on this obviously, but Commando was the cheapest Rolex ever ever sold. Uh, I think it was like a hundred bucks because um, it was uh, not it was a mechanical movement, not an automatic movement. Yeah, him, um, and it was sold at the PXs, um, uh, and you know I don't know how well it's sold there, but I know that any excess inventory that they gave to Abercrombie and Fitch for them to, for them to sell. Yep. And um, they wanted to kind of tip their cap to the kind of military provenance of the watches. So they stamped it commando. And so they were sold as commandos from, from Abercrombie and Fitch. And, and never, I don't think, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think it ever really caught on because it was really inexpensive and, not, not, you know, not the best, you know, Rolex, you know, automatic movement. Um, and, uh, and so I don't know really how many are, are out there, but it's, you know, it's become kind of this collector's watch. And again, I didn't know any of this. Like it kind of came across, I was offered the opportunity to get, get, get this one. And I thought it was so cool and didn't know anything about it. And again, like it wasn't one of these kind of like graily watches that everyone talks about. And so, um, it, uh, I, I got it and I, you know, I, um, I love it. I love wearing it. And, and it, it, it wear, you know, wears well under a suit. Um, I think I wear it, Tony, you know, I've seen you at uh, a couple like watchy things. And so it, it, there's not a ton of them out there. And so I felt yeah. like, you know, again, I don't have my, my RMs or my, my one of ones or, you know, my, my reshefs yet. Uh, so I, you know, so I can't really wow in that respect, but I thought that this one, it was a little unique. So I, I do wear it like a lot when at watch events sometimes. They're, they're super that, neat. Is that the history, right? Is that right, Ben? I don't yeah, know. Did, 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 did. Yes, I mean, absolutely correct. But what I was going to add is that, like, Ro Rolex has three tenets, right? It's it's precision, it's waterproofness, and it's self-windingness, basically. Like, that's mm -hmm. historically how they look at things. And, like, this one being a hand-wound watch, like, really lives outside the, those three tenets, obviously. And, I mean, as you said, like, it's a hand-wound watch, which in an oyster case of, in, in that period was was really, really uncommon. It's kind of mm -hmm. like a poor man's explorer. But as you rightly say, it is it is dramatically rarer, and I think interesting than than the average ten sixteen or sixty six ten. Yeah, I, I I I like that watch, but but you know it hasn't all been like, um, you know big 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 watches. You know there, there's other things that I've gotten that I love just as much. You know, um, I I got this um, Fremont um, parking alarm watch that I it's a few hundred dollars. Did you say Fremont? F R A M O N T. Okay. I don't know anything about Not the brand. Yeah, yeah. But the thing that I love about the watch is there's all these tool watches, right? Like watch innovations have come up to, to, to you know, certain things. So, you know, mm -hmm. the beginnings of the tourbillon was there. So on ships, you could circumnavigate the world and, and you know, calculate your longitude. Or the Milgauss was made so that the scientists at CERN, you know, when they're building the, the, the Hadrian Collider, could keep good time as they're changing the world. I literally have somebody's business card from CERN on my desk right now. That's so cool. That's so <laughs> cool. But this 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 Fremont parking alarm watch was a tool watch for a guy who didn't want to get a parking ticket. And so the alarm, <laughs> it's just the best tool watch. I could think it's so practical. So the alarm is like a half hour, an hour, 90 minutes, two hours. 
And I just imagine like it's, you know, not a precious metal. It's not precious anything, but I just imagine like a like a a salesman, you know what I mean? Who's like, you know, pulling up to the, to the, you know, to the store to try and sell his wares or encyclopedias or, you know, uh, a new vacuum cleaner and is in and out of, you know, commercial places and, and doesn't want to get a ticket because that would like put a ding in his monthly revenue, uh, like if, for his sales numbers. And so I like, I just, I just think stuff like that's so cool to me. Like what a cool problem that these watchmakers solved for. I just think that's, to me, that's as cool as, 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 um, you know, the, the scientists. Where does are. one find a watch like that? That watch I found, that was a purchase from, uh, Cameron okay. Barr, um, at, um, uh, Crafton Taylor. I keep, yes, at yeah. Crafton Taylor. And I went to visit him. He's at a great shop in downtown LA. And again, you know, one of the things I love about Cameron and I love about a lot of the watch people that I love, he's got great stuff, but he also also got, you know, great meaning like, you know, important stuff, but he's also got stuff that's really off the beaten path and just speaks to him. And I, I love that he kind of holds still, uh, you know, both of these kind of um, uh, parts of, of, of watch collecting uh, in, his, in his shop. And so I saw that. I just, again, thought it was so cool. That's um, great. Didn't know anything about it. So it's not all, you know, Rolex and, and, and AP. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's other cool acquisitions I, I love just as much, too. I'll cop to never having heard the word Fremont before, and it's a really cool sort of... I thought that was a joke. I'll, I'll, I'll send you, I'll send you a pic. It's, it's, it's so cool. It's so cool. No, I was Googling it while you were talking, obviously sort of like Memovox vibes, but you know, much more affordable. So for that, that reason alone, I, I, I love the thing. Oh yeah. It's, 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 and I think, you know, I think both of you guys, you know, uh, respond to both of those things. You hold both of those things. You can appreciate these, these incredible, you know, big baller watches, but then also find value in these really cool, you know, interesting, interesting things. One of the other things from the Talking Watches video, perhaps the most endearing part, uh, not that you're not endearing, Fred, it was towards the end of the video when <laughs> your, uh, your kids, you know, seemed insistent on showing off their, their small collections that they've been building to, to Ben and Hodinkee. Uh, are, they, are they still into the watch thing or have they, uh, have they taken to the sidelines for now? Absolutely still into the watch thing. And what's been so cool is you know, now they're, they're, uh, they're older and in those few years, what six or seven years that have passed, it's not a lot for us. We're the same, me and Ben, exactly the same, but identical. Like, that seven years for kids is, is massive. And yes, I mean, I did not think for a second, I, I remember watching the talking watch is cause I didn't like see a rough cut or anything like that. Like I just watched it. I couldn't believe they were on because they just, when I told him that Ben was coming over and Hodinkee and talking watches, the kids all got excited. And so they all got their watches together just to show, just to show them. Um, and uh, so I had no idea that they were going to be included. And there were some really wonderful things just in watching that, you know, the kids watches, um, you know, there was a photo of my dad, uh, me and my dad, it was in one of our bookshelves um, that they took a photo of and, and included um, in, in the piece, uh, you know, online. Uh, and he had, you know, passed away just uh, a year, a year before. So that was incredibly meaningful. So there are all these like deeply personal and important little Easter eggs that I found, you know, as an audience member watching, watching this talking watches. Um, but yes, all, all three in, in really into watches and in different ways, all in different ways. They all kind of went their own, own way. Um, my daughter now wears the Illinois that kind of started it all. She, she loves that watch. Um, and so she really loves, you know, vintage. She really loves vintage, old school, all the stuff that started me in, in watches, stained dials. And my daughter goes to the flea markets and um, she's 16 now and uh, just loves, buys vintage cameos. And, you know, she just loves that old vintage, uh, you know, unpolished, stained vibe. And so she brings that to her kind of love for, for watches. Um, my youngest uh, really, uh, is wearing watches all the time. He's, he's 11. Um, uh, he wears this Bulova diver, this, um, 666, the devil diver, they, they call it. And it's so cool. Uh, and I got it for him. I think he finished, I don't know, fourth grade or third grade. And was, was with me. I want to buy a watch with Ken Jacobs. And he loved this diver and I wanted to foster. He wears it all the time, but he's always wearing a watch. He's wearing 
that he's wearing his you know Seiko rowing blazers. He's wearing his Parchi, which he he loves you know more than anything. Um, the bigger one, the thirty six millimeter uh, Parchi that you know he loves. So he, my 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 youngest is always wearing a watch. We we went on vacation. We're gone for ten days. I think he brought four watches. So I think any watch collector listening can can relate to packing a small roll even for like a, a short trip. So he's he's all in. And then my oldest um, wears a lot of like vintage divers, you know, like he he loves the vintage look. So like, but he's, they're not, not all vintage. So he's wearing like, um, he used to wear the Shinola monster that kind of looked like a sub. And he wore this, um, there was a great uh, Benris reissued, the type one that he, he wore that a lot. Um, and he just turned 18. And so for his 18th birthday, I gave him, um, when he was like nine or 10, I bought a, a birth year sub for him, um, a 14060, simple, no date, still like that steel bezel, like a lot of, you know, just all the design DNA from like the old four digits. You know, it was like the, the last of like the real vintage G before the maxi case and the ceramic bezels and all that. Um, and uh, I got it for him when he was like nine or 10 and just put it in the safe thinking like this is only going to get more like, you know, steel Rolex sports models are only going in one direction, you know? And so I'm like, I'll get it now. And so I had it for like nine years and just gave it to him uh, last week. He turned 18. Oh, wow. And so, um, so he's got like a real, a real watch now. And so it's a uh, real watch. Yeah. A real watch. I don't have a sub. Uh, and so he, he really, um, he's, he's into it, but uh it's uh, they're they're all still loving watches, and they all have they all imbue them with different value and importance to them, and and that's the thing I love. Like that we all love about watches is it's just so pure. You know, they're not looking at what something's worth, and they're not tracking the value on Chrono, and they're not seeing what things sell at auction. They're just like, oh, this is something I like, and it's important to me because you know this reason or that reason, and um, it has nothing to do with you know value, price, worth, um, you know, uh, manufacturer. Uh, they, it's just very pure, and I I I love that, and I want to foster it as much as I can. Is he wearing the sub around yet? You know, it's funny he he isn't. Um, he has a job this summer, and so he's going back to his job later this week, so he might wear it to work. But you know, he doesn't want to. You know, he he. I I told him, and and my kids are great because you know it's it's not it's unpolished. You know what I mean? So it has, it's got some scratches on it and scrapes, and he's like, you know, Dad, I'm gonna wear this because you know. Watches are meant to be worn. I'm like, yes, like exactly. <laughs> he gets it. You know, he gets it. He gets it. it. <laughs> and also I put a lot of thought into like, I didn't, I'm very conscious of like, the, you know, is it appropriate for an 18 year old to be wearing a Rolex watch? I get it. Which right. is why I love that birth year and it's smaller and it's, it's a little more invisible. It's no date. It kind of just wears under the cuff and you know, you might not know what it is until you really look at the, at the dial. So I think it's something he can wear. Um, we decided maybe it's not for school. Maybe he's not wearing it to school. That but makes I think sense, I think. Yeah, but I think where to work. Um, Uncle Ben says that makes sense. But look, then that's the law. Are you kidding? Yeah. Me? <laughs> Uncle Ben, that's the law. But I think uh, you know weekends and work certainly and and yeah. out. But um, you know he's got a watch box of stuff he loves and really enjoys yeah. wearing. Uh, um, and now he's got this to kind of you know commemorate eighteen. I thought it was time to get a you know big boy watch when you when you hit eighteen. So so speaking of big boy watches, now correct me here, but I think when we filmed the talking watches, you only had vintage watches. There was a modern GMT in there. There was a modern GMT in there. Yes, there was. There was a there was a um there was a a, a Batman GMT on the Oyster. Got it. So yes, but you know that was also I got you know secondhand you know a uh, uh, secondary market dealer, and so you know the, the, my my relationships I don't really have relationships with ADs just because yeah. I you know it's all all the people I know and all the stuff that I really love um, has been you know, vintage and, and secondary market. So, um, so, but, but yeah, let me continue your question. Tell me, tell me what you're I, thinking. I was, I was just curious if you, you've kind of like dipped a toe into the modern watch world. And if so, why? And if, if not, why not? I think the modern watches, yes, I had that GMT. I, I, I have a, um, it's not really modern. It's modern ish that, um, the Alaska project Speedmaster, the reissue, Great watch, yeah. which is like 15 years or 16 years old already. And so, you know, honestly, the AD game really intimidated me. You know, um, I, I, I really felt like I, I didn't really know how to navigate it. I really didn't, you know, again, all my friends, all the dealers I knew and the collectors I knew, you know, 
vintage, and I've learned this now, is is such a small percentage of the of the watch collecting world, you know. Um, and to me, it seemed like the whole world because those were all the people I knew and the collectors, and the dealers, like I said, and the the things that I read. But in the as a marketplace, it's a very very. It's like I mean, you guys know better, but it's like five percent, if that, of the of the of the secondary market is like proper vintage, and so um, that that they just it just intimidated me. I didn't know how to penetrate it. I didn't know anybody in it. And I, I ended up, I have a friend um, who's a collector, great guy, Dave Park. And he invited me to go with him to a, um, uh, uh, an AD in Glendale, California, Bindi, Bindi Jewelers. The Bindis, uh, we know those guys. Oh, Ron and Ash are the best. Great and guys, I met they are. them briefly. I was at a dinner that Morgan King invited me to for Mont Blanc years before. And, so I, I, I knew them a little bit and, um, and I was with Dave who was buying his watches. I guess he got a call, but he's like, you should come. And, and they offered me a couple of watches and I didn't, I was so taken aback. I didn't know that like that was even, you know, on the menu. And so I didn't want to, I couldn't say no, but I also like hadn't discussed it with my wife and I didn't. So I just got like the cheapest watch that w- was what they, off- <laughs> what they offered me. Cause I'm like, Oh, I'll get a, I'll get a purchase history. and this will be great. And so I got like a, I got the, I got a green 41 millimeter, um, OP, uh, that that's, that's awesome that my daughter actually wears more than I do. She, she loves it. Um, but I just was like, Oh, I'll I'll get it. I'll meet at AD. And so it was, it it, it worked. Like I stayed in touch with Ron, uh, you know, Ron and Ash and they're great guys. They, they would have stayed in touch with me anyway, but I thought I had to get in the, the, get in the game. And I was again at a Christmas, they, they, they opened their, they had a new store opening and there was a Christmas party that my friend Dave invited me to. So I went and, um, at that party, they offered me the Destro and I just thought that watch was so cool. And I, I had the, I already had a GMT two. I didn't really need another one. Um, in fact, if anyone's interested in that Batman, I should need to get that out. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you can, in the comments. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I thought that I just thought that again, knowing a little bit more about watches and about the history of the brands, they look exactly the same to the uninitiated, but for Rolex to flip that movement and put the date, you know, on the nine, like it's such a Titanic, uh, shift for them. It's such a massive, um, uh, change in their watchmaking and evolution. I just liked the storytelling of that watch in the, in the history of the brand. Um, and, uh, you know, again, it's one of those watches. Like if you don't really know, I, I, you know, I, I brought her home and I showed my wife and my kids. I'm like, what, what, what's different about this watch? What do you see? And it was just, it was my, my, my youngest, my 11 year old, those crowns on the wrong side. I was like, yeah, I'm so, <laughs> on the wrong not side, everyone, yeah. not everyone knows what they're looking at, but, um, yeah. I, I really like that. So, so, so to answer your question, like the Bindis are the best. Uh, if I want to get any anything any modern Rolex, I'll, I'll get it to them. Um, they're they're phenomenal. Uh, great jewelry too. Got my wife some jewelry. Not to play the AD game because they are amazing jewelers as well. Um, but uh, uh, still, you know, still the pre-owned is is kind of where I I live and and my yeah, where your heart life. where your heart lies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because there's also that like like I was saying that again, the watches I love the most are the ones I had no intention of getting. And right. so like to go on the list and wait for the years and get the call. I know that there's something exciting about that, but to walk in, like I walked into, um, you know, Jeff Hess is a good friend and, and Vincent Prosesco. And when they started it at, at, um, Sotheby's, I want, I wanted to go to the auction, their first auction and, and just support them and be there for them. Um, and I went to the preview and I just saw this, this, uh, 50 fathoms, this Aqualong double signed 50 fathoms. And I was just like, Oh my God, this is incredible. Like I never liked 50 fathoms. I didn't get it. And I saw it and I was like, this is incredible. And I ended up getting it at that, at that first auction. Um, but you know, there's like a, there's like an impulse element to the secondary market that yeah. you can see something, you can love it and it could be yours the next day or that yeah. day. And um, I, I just, that's been probably one of the most thrilling aspects of, of my journey is walking somewhere, seeing something, um, you know, whether it's that Fremont parking watch. Uh, if I had a moment to think about that, I wouldn't have gotten that watch, but it was so cool. I <laughs> wanted to get it. And so, there, you know, so whether it's that watch or, or um, 
you know, it, it's uh, it's that ten sixteen that my that that or, or this date just you know that my wife got it want to buy a watch. Like I don't think we're thinking about that for years. Like you see it, you love it, and you can have it. And um, there's that element of the secondary market that I just that I just love. Do you regret a lot of purchases when uh, that's sort of the mindset, or or not really? You know, I make a lot of promises to myself and to my wife that things, when things come in, things will go out. And I haven't really gotten rid of much of anything. And so, I mean, there shouldn't been a lot of huge regrets. I think that ta- like my tastes have evolved, you know, as I've learned more and, and grown more. And I think that 50 Fathoms is a, is a perfect example. And, and I think now, as I was talking to you guys, wanting to move more towards, you know, less, you know, less sports models and getting into some, you know, more, more gentlemen's watches. You know, I want to say sophisticated watches because they're all pretty sophisticated, but you guys know what I mean. So I think my tastes have evolved and changed, but I don't know if there's anything in my watch box that I'm like, man, I really shouldn't have done that. Um, There's definitely like, I can't believe I did that, but there isn't a lot of, um, there isn't a lot of regrets Uh, because I also think, and I don't have to get like too corny about it, but like, I think that my watch journey, if you want to call it that my, my life in watches has been, it's been not as much about the watches as, as it is like the experiences, you know what I mean? And so all these watches I associate with a person or an event or an experience or a moment. And I think that that really has been the most enriching part of this whole, this whole ride has been the people and the experiences and the relationships. And so like even a watch that might not get a lot of wrist time is still connected to some moment that is meaningful. And so, no, I don't think, I can't say that there's a lot of regret, um, which I haven't thought about it in those terms, Tony, but that, that, that's kind of cool. I like that. You mentioned at the top, you know, the days of you being a diver or serving in the military or being a pilot are, are gone, but you dropped a little nugget in your talking watches that you were a pilot, that you did have a pilot's license. And I've always I, wanted to to sort of ask, first of all, why? And then second of all, where is uh, Fred Savage jetting off to uh, on the weekends with his pilot's license? You know, I, I, the why is I just, it just seemed like when my kids were little, you could go to the Santa Monica airport they, and there's, there's bleachers on the, on the runway. And so I would take them and watch them, you know, you would watch the planes take off and land. And it was, we would go that when they were really little um, and they, they loved it. And so I saw a guy hop out of one of the planes and the plane, you know, went to the runway and took off. And I was asking guys, oh, what, what's going on? He goes, oh, that's a student pilot. You know, he's, that's his first solo. And I never even really thought like, oh, you can learn how to do that. It's so cool. And so I just felt like it, it felt like the most foreign thing in the world to me. And so difficult. And I just thought, oh, let me just take one lesson and see what it's like. And I loved it. I just thought it was so cool. And, and again, like, you know, you get to a point where like, you're always, you know, I, I'm always, I'm always very curious about things and always trying to learn a little bit and try to pick something up. And it just seemed like so foreign. And I was like, oh, I, it'd be so cool to learn that. Like, how do you learn that? And so I threw myself in and got kind of caught up in it. and got my pilot's license, but sadly, like during COVID, like whenever I don't fly for a while, I don't don't own a plane or anything, so I was like renting them. Um, And whenever you don't fly for a while, like I want to take a lesson with an instructor, just, you know, make sure I can land and it's all right. And, um, And so during COVID, I just didn't have that, like they weren't putting people in the planes with instructors. I wasn't flying as much. And then I lost all my recency. And so now like I'm, like, I think, I think if I start again, I'd have to start all over. Um, oh, no. But it was a great, like, journey. And one of the coolest things I've ever done. One of the coolest things. So, so right. of, did you do it out of Santa Monica? I did it out of Santa Monica. Yeah. Also known as the site of the Talking Watches with Spike Ferriston. Oh, did you do that? Is that what you did it? I didn't know that. Yeah, we filmed it in his hangar there. Uh, and across the way while we were filming was Harrison Ford's hangar. And he was there with the oh, door that's up. So cool! It was so cool. And then, like two two hangers down, was Keanu Reeves working on his motorcycle. It was like so L.A. It was unbelievable. That's amazing. And just a few down was me renting 
uh, a, uh, a, a PA28 for like an hour um, and making sure that the price they quoted me was wet. I didn't have to buy fuel also. Um, so yeah, it's all, we're all, it's all the same. <laughs> so no pilots watching. Sadly, watch I'm not going, sadly, I'm not going anywhere, Tony. I'm not flying anywhere. But I feel like in a pinch, um, like when I, you know, if they need me, I'm, I'm there. Um, and when I really want to embarrass my kids as we're boarding planes, I make sure to let the, the people, the, 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 the staff know, the crew know that, that um, if need be, you know, I have like 100 hours. So, you know, maybe 120. So like, it, like, you know, like, a, uh, like an independence day type of scenario where like they need pilots, that type of thing. Like you'd be, yeah. Ready. Oh, yeah. I, I'm waiting. Oh man. I'm waiting. I'm waiting for independence day. Yes, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Not the air Force, not the ones like that didn't break the speed of sound. But if, right. if you need someone to fly a plane that goes slightly faster than a car, <laughs> um, like I'm your guy, like I'm like, yes. If you need a single engine pilot to get like, you know, a f you know, like 50 miles in perfectly clear conditions, because I'm not instrument rated, then yeah, <laughs> I'm ready to go. I'm ready to serve. Noted. So no pilot's <laughs> watches really uh, added to the collection in the past few years then? No. I mean, other than, other than that, that, that GMT, um, oh, sure. oh, which, but I had yeah. that then. I had that then. Um, no, no, no pilot's watches because I felt like I'd be a fraud. Um, that's where like, I got, like, I really wanted a Seiko diver, you know, I really wanted those 6105, you know, the, the Willards. Um, and I'm like, I can't be an imposter. And so I signed up to get my scuba certification, um, so that I could go buy the dive watch and, and feel like I, I had earned it. I did all, my wife's like, you did all that for, so you could buy this watch. I'm like, uh-huh. I think one of the sort of emotional overtones of your talking watches is uh maybe a philosophy or a quote that that you relayed from your dad sort of uh you relay it in relation to the 1016 but you talk about how he always wanted a, a t-bird and never got one and you say something to the effect of uh you know you deserve to treat yourself every once in a while and if it's something that makes you you happy go for it so i'm wondering if you could uh just talk about that as a philosophy in terms of um the way you go about living your life and, and maybe as much as it applies to, to buying or collecting watches too. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Tony, that's so cool that you remember that. Yeah. My, um, my dad had a 57 T bird in college and as an adult, it's something you always wanted again. You, know, you always wanted that, that T bird. Um, and he never, he never got it for himself. He never got it for himself. Um, and he could have, you know, he could have, you know, he's my dad was very fiscally responsible and very like, practical and pragmatic you know he, he he'd say to me he goes i don't i don't, I don't know why you spend you know a hundred dollars on dinner you know you, you go you go to dinner it's, it's over he goes see the alarm clock i got that alarm clock 30 years ago I paid 19 dollars for it people said it was crazy 19 dollars. i had it for 30 years <laughs> that's my dad's kind of philosophy you know um very pragmatic but he could have gotten it and it wouldn't have changed our lives you know we, we, we would have kept the lights on the next month it would have changed anything and 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 um, I think oh, towards the end of the life, he was like, yeah, I should have, I should have done it, you know? And, um, uh, he's like, you gotta just, you know, be responsible, be practical, you know, make sure you can keep the lights on, you know, the next month, obviously, but, um, but you could treat yourself once in a while. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some years I take that a little too much to heart, you know, <laughs> it can't all be dessert. So I treat myself maybe too much some years as it comes to watches. But I, I do think that in the back of my head is that kind of like, yeah, like, you know, I don't know. Life's short, man. Life's short. And uh, it changes so much, you know, so quickly. And if you have these windows, you know, to, to have these opportunities, to do these things, to get that watch, to get your scuba certification, to, to you know, I don't know. I say do it, you know. Someone else I'm I, I, I working with now would said to me as I was weighing a similar should I do talking watches or not? He's like if someone opens a door, walk through it, walk to the door. Um, and so uh, and so I've I've tried to embrace that you know again not just in the collecting but um, you know in 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 life too. Like it's it's short. Like you know if it's not putting you or, or anyone you love or your life in in jeopardy, like say just in. Walk to the door. Like, I think that uh, it's a short, short journey. And, uh, 
it's over way too soon. So I, I say do what you can to make yourself happy and enjoy it. Have some experiences. Maybe this is a nice... That was way too deep for a watch talk, right? Was that, was that really... <laughs> that was too much, right? It's connected though, right? It's all connected. No question. Isn't it's, it? Or did I, let's go way off. I think you've invoked enough cliches that I, I won't invoke anymore, but it's it's all true. It's all connected. And this is part of the <laughs> Thank reason you, we Tony, all love sorry. watches. <laughs> Life is short. No, but no, no, true. I don't know. No apologies <laughs> needed, Fred. We love it. Uh, it, it. It does provide a natural segue, though, to I think the last thing I wanted to ask you about, which is uh, something we've spoken a bit about over the past few months, which is your your latest venture or, or company, uh, Timepiece Grading Specialist. So I'm wondering if you could talk first of all about the impetus for for that and and what the hell TGS is um yeah i i, I it's uh it's something I'm, I'm just starting we're going to kick it off uh next month you know after after labor day um and uh basically i was collecting watches knew a little bit you know would, was didn't have a regular dealer i was reading the blogs and the, and the, and the forums that I, I knew, I feel like I knew just enough to be kind of dangerous. And I ended up buying a watch at auction. It was this, uh, this 1803, this, you know, white gold day date. And, um, I was like, oh, I've really arrived. Like it's a collector. Like I really, I really got somewhere now. I got this cool watch at auction. And so I wear it. And, you know, I like so many people, we watch people. I had my little, um, album in my phone of all my watches and, we're showing it to people and someone's like, oh, what's that watch? I'm like, oh, that's, I got this at auction. And, uh, and, and he said, oh, no, that's no, that's no good. I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, it was it'd been redialed. And I didn't even really know what that meant. Um, he goes, yeah, look, the stirrup on the X is no good and the hash marks aren't evenly spaced. It's, it's, that's no good. And I was just crestfallen. And I was like, wow, like, you know, if you can't trust these, like, how, who are you supposed to, trust when you if you buy some on the secondary market how are you supposed to know what you're getting and so i really committed myself uh to to meeting and 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 getting to know um you know really great reputable dealers and and um and co collectors and scholars and people i could talk to and and when i was at roly fest you know last year i looked around the room and i'm like wow like i've really gotten to a place where you know you know the best people in the watch world are one or two phone calls away. The best scholars and journalists and, uh, you know, sellers and collectors. Um, but that's pretty rare air. That's pretty privileged air. You know, not everybody knows an expert. And when I started looking at all these other collectible verticals, whether it's baseball cards or um, coins or stamps or handbags or shoes or video games, every one of those collectibles has uh, one or more um, third-party uh, grading and authentication services. And when I looked at the secondary market of watches, it's all still predicated on you buy the seller, which completely works when you're buying from great sellers. But you don't always know who you're buying from. There's a lot of you know person-to-person -person websites that facilitate um, uh, you know watch purchases. Uh, there's a lot of, um, there's some terrific dealers, but there's a lot of dealers who might not know the difference. Uh, and so I felt like the watch buyer on the secondary market, which as you guys were saying, I, I primarily am, deserves to have the same confidence that someone buying a baseball card has or that someone buying an old comic book has. Um, and so uh, I wanted to start a grading and authentication service for watches. Um, and so I did. It's called Timepiece Grading Specialists, TGS. And so um, my hope is to bring that same sense of confidence and empowerment to anyone who's buying a watch on the secondary market, whether it's people who are there now, uh, but also people who might want to get in, but are kind of, uh, you know, put off by the opacity of it. And I think if we can make that more transparent, and not just in the authenticity, but in the grading, you know, this is watch is a nine versus this watch is a seven. Like, why? You know, is it is there a scratch on the you know case? Is there a scratch on the dial? Is the is the crown aftermarket? Is the bracelet aftermarket? Is the bezel been replaced? I want people to know the answers to those questions because I'm a big believer that there's a buyer for every watch. You know, um, not every watch has to be perfect. There's a, a buyer for every watch, but I think that we can empower the people in the market more and invite more people in, which will only benefit all of us um, into the secondary market if there's a trusted 
third party, meaning we don't buy watches, we don't sell watches. We're just evaluating the watch as an object. Um, service who can tell you, you know, what it is uh, and the conditions condition it's in. And um, I think it'll give people that much more confidence as they buy on the secondary market and that and that market continues to grow. Yeah, I think the problems you've identified are the biggest threats to the sort of long-term viability of, of vintage watches in particular. So so any project that sort of looks to take those on is is something that sort of is exciting to me. Uh, and I, I look forward to hearing more about it. Hey, in just a few weeks, I know you're going to be at Geneva Watch Days as well. If you see Fred Savage roaming around Geneva, uh, self tell tell him uh, tell him hello and congratulate yeah, him. Come, come say hi. I don't. I don't. I, I. I. Geneva is very exciting. Again, applied the same lessons learned from talking watches. When Way was like, "Hey, come to Geneva," I was like, "Ah, uh-huh. all right." Um, and so, uh, so Tony, I know you'll be there. I'm very excited to see you. Uh, but yeah, it's we're 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 kicking it off and and talking to you know a bunch of people kind of in the collector community, um, in the secondary market community, but also you know brands. Um, I think we can kind of bring value to 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 everybody. So um, it's been it's been really exciting and and really really well received. And you know hopefully we can um, you know uh, bring more people kind of into the into the community and uh, and and give the people who already are. Um, that much more confidence to to get a watch on the secondary market. Well, Fred, thank you again for joining the show. Ben, thanks for thanks for coming along for the ride as well. Thanks to you all for My listening. Pleasure. Vic Ottominelli for editing. And we'll see you all again next week for another episode of Hodinkee Radio.